No mai ngā mata o te motu, whakatata mai anora, kei ngā kaiwhaka mahiri o te ora, koutou i o koutou kāinga, marae, wahi mahi, i hea ke rā nei. Ki te kaupapa o te rangi nei, e whakakao mai nei a tātou, whiki mai, ka ke mai, ko tana po rākina tōku ingoa, tēnā rā koutou katoa. On behalf of NIB, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us for this one-hour webinar, where we've teamed up with neuroscience educator and NIB parenting expert, Nathan Wallace. He will bring you science-backed advice through a tikanga Māori lens about raising tamariki in today's world. Before I introduce Nathan, NIB are proud to walk alongside you through your health and wellbeing journey and would love to show you a short clip on some of the teams that make this happen. NIB's health engagement teams are here to totoko you on your arahaora. Kia ora, I'm Jennifer, one of the wellness coaches at NIB New Zealand. Our health engagement team is made up of wellness coaches Kaiarahi and ACC Health Navigators. Wellness coaches are qualified healthcare professionals here to totoko you on your wellness journey. We provide personal ongoing support to help you look after your health and help you recover faster from your treatments. Kia ora koutou, ko Rawinia tuku ingoa. Here at NIB, our kaiarahi support you in navigating the healthcare system. We explain how to access policy benefits, submit claims, and how to make the most of the health initiatives and programs that NIB provide. Hi, I'm Marchna and I'm an ACC Health Navigator. I can assist you with managing claims that have been submitted to ACC. We can identify if your treatment should be provided by ACC and help support you to access the additional benefits available under ACC, such as income compensation, home health, equipment and transportation. We want to help you live a healthier life and to support you on your journey to better health. This is why we offer a number of health management programs to help you proactively manage your health and well-being. We can then enrol eligible members into our health management programs free of charge. Through these initiatives, we've been able to help members like Katrina, who was struggling with understanding her complex health conditions. She reached out to our kaiarahi, who were able to provide a wellness coach to give her ongoing, dedicated support. This included finding a suitable GP, booking appointments, completing pre-approval forms, and facilitating a nurse to be with her during her post-operation recovery. We were able to help Katrina and her whānau in this stressful time. NIB's health management programs are helping more people like Katrina to be proactive with their health and supporting them to live longer, happier, healthier lives. For more information on our health management programs, get in touch with our wonderful team by emailing kaiarahi at nib.co.nz or by calling 0800 642 what is the most important thing in the world? It is the people. It is the people. It is the people. Raising happy and healthy tamariki with Nathan Wallace. Nathan is of Ngāti Kahu Ki Whangaroa descent, a neuroscience educator, presenter, author, and has been NIB's per resident parenting expert since 2019. He tours locally and internationally while collaborating with NIB to provide matua with academically backed practical advice to raise healthy and happy tamariki. Recently, he hosted a parenting series on Fakata Māori, Kids Don't Come With a Manual, where he supported concerned matua with their tamariki, equipping them with tools and resources through a tikanga Māori lens. We're very excited to have him join us here today and share some of this valuable advice. Kia ora koutou katoa, ka mihi nui kia koutou. Uh, ai, uh, he, he mihi nui kia, kia koutou, mō tō tautoko ki te kaupapa i tēnē pō. So yeah, welcome everybody, excited to do tonight. Hea hatu kaupapa, ko te whānau Māori. To be able to look through a Māori lens at some of your questions that you're asking. Um, yeah, it's a real privilege, so let's just bowl into it, right? Anyone that's heard me talk before might know that I get really passionate about the first thousand days. That's a phrase that we sort of coined about the 1990s where we learned just the huge importance of all your outcomes as an adult based on this first thousand days. So that starts from conception, so includes the whole time in the whare tangata, all the pregnancy, and goes to 1,000 days after conception. Basically, um, 
you know, a lot of your outcomes are about fuck a popper and jeans, but a lot of it is about that early development in the first thousand days. And to cut to this chase, Fano, what the baby needs is connection and intimacy and presence by other people. Really, your brain's amazing, my brain's amazing. It's where our brains come together that you see the real magic of neuroscience and um, human connection. So that's what your baby needs. They just need a predictable, so you know, it tends to be one person, um, intimately attuned, responsive, you're picking up on the baby's cues. You want your baby feeling safe and in that whole rangi Māori, real peaceful place. You know, that's the best place for the baby. Now that doesn't necessarily have to be mum. I know we've got a history of mums often the main prime, you know, the primary caregiver. But in the research we use the term dyad, which is a Greek word meaning two-way relationship. Because really there's no scientific evidence that it has to be mum. What the baby needs is an attuned, responsive relationship, like we said. So, you know, if, um, if mum's, you know, not very responsive, likes to look at a screen all the time, doesn't use much facial expression, and dad's an over-animated PE teacher, then the science would suggest that baby's better at home with dad. It's really, like I say, about the connection. So you might have a grandparent stay at home. Um, they could have home-based care. You can go to a childcare centre and have a primary carer. As long as baby gets that connection to that intimate, responsive relationship, then you're doing pretty well. You're maximising that first thousand days. Yeah, it's all about that ahura mōwai, a little paradise that the child's in, where they feel connected and all loved up. It's really the most of that you can get, the better. Okay, so um, I get asked often about children being at childcare centres, and childcare centres don't really do children any harm. You know, um, like I say, it's about that intimate relationship. So if your child's got that, and they love their teacher, then it's probably a good indication that things are doing pretty well. Um, the benefits to being in a childcare centre really start to accrue after the age of three. So if they're at home with Vano in the first three years, that's catch play as well. You know, um, Social skills and all those sorts of things, you don't need to do those until three. That first three years or thousand days is all about that intimate connection. Um, if you are starting in the middle of preschool, it's worth making those first vis visits um, successful. So I always say to Farno, don't go in for a long time. Don't stay there for hours where you've got times where you're playing with a child and times where you wander away. I'd make that first experience 100% positive. So I might only be there 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You know, you want to go at a slow pace. You want to match your child's pace because as soon as they feel hurried, you start to feel stressed. So kia tau, chill. Um, but get in there, give the child a positive experience. So I would stay close to them, sort of um, monitor what they're doing. Basically, you want to preempt any negative stuff happening with other kids. You don't want a negative experience that first time. So do what you can to set it up to be successful and scaffold the child's interactions, stay nice and close. Maybe leave your cell phone in the car for that visit because you'll be much more attentive and attuned to the child if you don't have that constant you know, um, distraction. Um, but yeah, just give them a positive experience interact with some kids, get out of there so they can have a start, middle and an end to what was a positive experience. That's way more likely to make them transition to um, early childhood centre much easier for both of you. When we start primary school, increasingly there's like a trend to go towards having a group start. So, you know, when I went to school, you started on your birthday and you do get some advantages with that. You get individual attention, but I think it might be easier experience for the child if they're starting in a group. So look if your school has that possibility. They can all start at the start of the term. Um, about is it the right time for them, you know, children experience stress when they go to school. Um, I mean, monitor their stress, see how they're going. Usually children have a pretty um, good time about it. If that looks like it's even slightly negative, then start to talk to the teacher. You really want to make that transition as smooth as possible and as positive as possible. So any signs of stress, going backwards in their behaviour, you know, if they haven't been bedwetting, go back to bedwetting, they had used to go to sleep fine, now they're getting up and down all night. Any regression in behaviour probably shows they're under stress. So just talk to the teacher, they'll be wanting to work with you to slow that down, calm it down, to have a good positive experience. I mean, with my kids, I would leave them home on a Wednesday afternoon for the first sort of month or so, because they often needed a sleep, and going the whole week was too much, so no one's going to arrest you for that, you know. Monitor your child's, um, you know, reaction and see if they need that sort of thing, that sort of help. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're, they go way backwards and there's major developmental delays happening and the teacher isn't happy about, you know, where they're up to, and either are you, then, yeah, you need to seek further help. Then go and talk to your doctor and they'll lead you on to the appropriate services. Really, when a child starts school, it's not so much about their reading and writing. We have preschool checks in this country, which ask you about your reading and writing before they start school, but they're not based on what the research says actually makes your child ready for school. They're based on picking up any problems nice and early. What you need to focus on, Fano, to get your child really ready for school is what the literature calls le uh, learning dispositions. 
what that means is cognitive things like writing your name, knowing your colours, knowing your numbers, cognitive results plateau at eight. What that means in plain language is whether you're typically, if your child learns to read at four, or write the name at four, or they don't learn to read or write their name until they're seven, after the age of eight, no one can tell for the rest of their lives. So what you really want to get to go to school, learning dispositions are things like um, persevering through failure. If your child you know, gives up as soon as they get it wrong, or they, the first attempt doesn't try, that's not a positive learning disposition. You want to persevere through failure. So um, in early childhood, they encourage the child to choose their own activity. You know, something like damming a creek might look like they're wasting their time, but no kid dams a creek successfully the first time. They persevere through failure. These are the learning dispositions that actually, you know, set us up to do well at school. Can they express their emotions? Because if they can't and they get overwhelmed all the time, that interrupts learning. You know, can they work in a group? Are they starting to exercise some self-control and some self-management skills? Can they go to the toilet by themselves, open the lunchbox by themselves? It's those things that are going to allow them to be um, independent. That really is what we want to see first for school readiness. Um, when people ask me about environments, you know, how does the environment impact a child's overall um, outcomes? It's worth remembering that 50% of your outcomes are predictable from birth in your genes. That reassures me as a parent, um, I can only be blamed for 50% of it, because 50% was already there. That means the environment is hugely important, makes up 50% of your outcomes. Um, yeah, what we say in human development is temperament plus experience equals personality. So that effectively means your personality can change quite easy, you know, um, just change the experience and you change your personality. If I'm a teacher and spend all day nurturing and then I become a prison guard, my experience is going to change, so my personality will change, but who I was as a teacher or a prison guard is the same person underneath. That's your temperament. So temperament doesn't change across your whole life. So children are already born someone, and their environment's always got to interact with that. Um, so that's why we get such different and unique outcomes. But really, it's about, again, connection. You know, if we, 50% is in your genes, 50% is in the environment, the more often a child feels connected, uh, loved, nurtured by their whanau, are validated. It tends to be, the more of that they experience, the better their behaviour is, the easier they are to parent, and the better all their growth and outcomes are. Really, it's, um, it's anger and isolation in early childhood especially. We see this over and over again in the research. Uh, the more they experience anger, um, the more they experience being alone and by themselves and scared, generally the worse their behaviours are, and the harder they are to parent, and this impacts negatively on their, you know, their growth and well-being. So. Yeah, it's all about connection. About, a lot of it's about us adults staying calm, you know. Gato, calm ourselves down and model that good behaviour. Mm. So, I mean, culture is a big part of environment. So when people ask me what is culture, culture is really everything you do, and it's also everything you don't do. It's everything you say, but importantly, it's also everything you don't say. So, I mean, it is the environment. There's in cases the whole environment. It's... um. You know, we are so open to experience human beings, we're so open to learn whatever we um, come across, and that's where culture plays a big role. You know, our culture will decide what our, our problem-solving strategies are, about what our norms are, what our values are, um, how we believe in ourselves as people. So yeah, it's hugely important in your culture. Generally, a lot of people, especially if you grow up with everybody around you as the same culture, I grew up in the South Island, it was pretty monocultural when I was growing up, so you're not consciously aware of culture. Um, but when you start to interact with other cultures, that's when you really start to notice your own. So that's great for the person's metacognition. Metacognition is like knowing yourself as a learner, knowing how your brain works. When you interact with other people from a different culture, then you see the things that are different and you, it's just easier to identify your own culture when you see someone else's as different. We sort of call this metaculture, you know, when you can understand two different cultures. That really helps for us as people to cover our blind spots and the things that we might be taking for granted in our culture that are maybe offensive to somebody else. Um, culture's always evolving, so it's really a set of skills, but our children are growing up in an international, vibrant world. I think Auckland's the most multicultural city per head of population in the world, so the ability to interact with other cultures and um, yeah, learn from that, that's a hugely important skill for our kids, so embrace that. Uh, speaking of that, language development. So obviously language is a part of culture. Humans, you know, for most of their history, stayed in little tribal groups, and we tended to speak lots of different languages because we only spoke our own local language. So basically, to cut a long story short, what we see in the neuroscience evidence is a very big celebration of being bilingual. When we look at other interventions, learning a musical instrument, you know, going to a private school, 
any other individual intervention tends to only change a narrow little uh, pathway in the brain. The reason we get all excited about bilingualism is because essentially it basically enhances and physically grows the actual substrates in the brain which are underpin all your higher intelligence. So being bilingual is one of the few things we can say from an academic point of view actually makes the child more intelligent, clearly. You know, there's benefits to the third language, the fourth language, the fifth language, but those structural changes we're talking about that are going to help you to control your emotions, you know, regulate your behaviour, uh, focus your attention, be more intelligent, um, those changes tend to take place moving from one language to two. So, yeah, the other languages are beneficial, but it's really that second language, embrace that. I know um, I'm in the same generation with lots of people, lots of whānau Māori, that um, our grandparents were fluent speakers. Uh, they tried not to speak it to our parents, so they'd you know, get the benefits of the Pākehā. And then so my generation grew up with very little te reo Māori. So um, it was encouraging to me to find out that you only need 60 words within a language to retain all the unique sounds within that language. So um, what that means is if I learn two waiata, within that two waiata there will be all of these sounds that we associate um, just with te reo Māori. So you don't need to be a fluent speaker, that means just get two waiata safely under your belt and you're regularly using those neural pathways in your baby's brain. So if they do go on to acquire the real later, they can speak that with a native accent if you are using 60 words around them from the time of birth. So yeah, it can be hard taking on a whole new language. When I enrolled at university, I had no idea it was going to be that hard. But it's so rewarding, you know, in terms of understanding where you come from, um, your language, your, your culture, your ancestry, your history. Yeah, it's hugely affirming. Um, you know, any language is going to have a positive, I mean, a first language is the first language to the brain. There isn't really negative or positive languages. We know that um, sign language, for instance, engages all the parts of the brain that our typical language does. So, yeah, it really, it doesn't matter whether it's Te Reo Māori, or if it's Spanish, or if it's English, a first language is a first language, and it's the second language, regardless of what it is, that really gives you all those benefits to the brain. You know, in, um, in the literature, they talk about English as being the language of technology. So the structure of English, the way it's spoken, it lends itself really well to speaking about technology. Most people in the world who work around technology speak English. Another example, uh, Spanish. It's often seen as the business, uh, the business language. Spanish is the language spoken in more countries than any other individual language. And, and it, again, lends its structure and stuff well to um, business. Te reo Māori is seen as a spiritual language as in the words they use, the things that that language tends to notice, um, they all refer to spirituality and um, energies that are not necessarily tangible and seen. So, um, yeah, that means if you are uh, Māori and you learn Te Reo Māori, you know, you learn a lot of things that you couldn't have possibly learned in English because they're just not really noticed in English. So, yeah, can't go on enough really about how the bilingualism really supports um, you know, your neuro neurological growth and gives massive benefits to the child. I mean, if I take a Māori child and I teach them Italian, then that's beneficial because they get the, the, the benefits of a second language. But if I teach them Te Reo Māori, they, they get two benefits, really. They get to learn about another language and all the benefits we just talked about, um, but also you validate who they are and their culture and where they come from. And Self-esteem is just so hugely important to learning that mm, beneficial on all levels, really. Yeah, can't say enough about being bilingual. Embrace that whānau, no matter where you are on the journey. Um, you might just be saying whare pake, but you know, embrace it and use it because it's a, it's a good thing for the brain. Mm -hmm. Okay, race through that information. Um, anything you want to add, Tana? Any questions you want to ask? Yeah, so Nathan, these questions were submitted during the registrations uh, okay. from a whānau member. I'd love some strategies on technology, tikanga for the whole whānau. We have two toddlers and we are struggling with boundaries on devices, screen time, etc. Well, first of all, kāpai tō whakaaro. It's good that you're realising that, you know, that you're realising you're spending more time on the screen. And you talk about role modelling, and that's really is where it's at. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's a question I get asked a lot by parents because it is a big topic. And when we looked at traditional tikanga, you know, we didn't have screens. But there would have been traditional tikanga around how we approach new technologies and being wary of those and what, you know, what age you're allowed them. Essentially, you know, as a parent, we have to manage technology. It's a part of our kids' lives. But there is a correlation between the more time you spend on a screen, the more chance there is as a teenager you'll have anxiety and depression. So you're right to be concerned, Farno, but I don't think you have to get rid of the screen altogether. What the literature tells us is children who come from a home with two hours a day device-free time so that might be you negotiate with the kids and go, okay, between four and six, there's no devices. You put them away, plug the cell phone in the kitchen to be charged. 
you know, they might, I mean, we chose four to six in my whanau because that's when we were cooking tea and getting all the jobs done. Admittedly, when you took the phone off them, there was lots of tea towel flicking and stuff like that, but at all that interaction, even if it's fighting, that's what the brain's been doing for, you know, 100,000 years. Um, so it tends to give the brain what it needs. What I'm saying is you don't need to do it all day. As long as it's two hours every day, then the brain um, gets what it needs and you take yourself outside the, or the child outside the risk group for anxiety and depression, which I found really encouraging because, you know, it's a hard thing to manage as a parent. Yeah. Um, you mentioned role modelling, and I think that's yeah, very insightful of you because that's really where the key is. So I would role model being good with my phone, especially in the car. You know, I'm not a, what do you call it, native, native digital, digital native, so I don't even know the word, but what it means is technology is very secondary to me, so I wouldn't try and text and drive anyway. I know a lot of the generation, uh, younger generation do, and it's a big concern, so I always modelled with the kids, turning the phone onto silent, putting it in the glove box, and saying, I'll check that when I get back. If you do that, then they are seeing boundaries put in place, and they tend to put boundaries in place. So a good way of starting those boundaries is to have device-free time at home, two hours a day. I mean, increasingly schools are changing it so the kids don't have devices. I read lots in Australia and um, in Queensland, they've made it illegal in all schools. So then those parents don't have to have two hours of device-free time at home because they're doing it at school. So yeah, as long as they get exposed to that two hours. Be warned though, when you ask the kids what two hours, they're going to ask for 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. That's what my kids ask for. But no, they have to be awake for the two hours, right? So yeah. Nathan, he pātai anō, what are your responses to services like Oranga Tamariki, mm -hmm. who come into whare o whānau Māori and expect the Western way of parenting rather than one based in traditional Māori values that prioritise manaki tanga, tiaki, and gentleness with our tamariki? All right, pai tō whakaaro. I like what you say there about manaki tanga, tiaki, gentleness. You know, we do really see that in the traditional tūturu approach to Māori parenting. The only record that we have written-wise of Māori parenting, I mean, we have lots of history in terms of whakatauki and kiwaha and things, and waiata, um, but written-wise, it's the missionaries. They were here for about 80 years before the Treaty of Waitangi, and they all have to write diaries. And so, I mean, they're writing it quite crit uh, critically, being negative, but they, because they're telling us that we overspoil and overindulge our babies and things. So it's it come full circle and it looks positive now. Even though they're saying it with a negative lens, it's all really positive practices. It makes you really proud to be Māori and to see just how strength-based and um, and how attuned and responsive they were. So yeah, um, that's why I say pai tō I agree with you that we want to use a more gentle approach. It is a tūtūra Māori approach. But I've also got lots of aroha for the people working in Tamariki Ora. That's a huge job. You know, they do have huge mahi and they are under-resourced. There is no magic solution. So I think everyone's up to where they are in their journey of decolonization. So what I'm saying is if that person from Oranga Tamariki, the best they've got to offer is some, you know, stuff from the 1980s, you have to have some aroha for that person. I mean, I know you're right. Like I say, they should be using a traditionally a tikanga Māori approach. Um, but yeah, everyone's where they are at their journey. So I think rather than criticise, you want to maybe gently um, encourage them towards this programme called a mana rireki. That was made out of all of those um, written accounts from the missionaries about what traditional Māori parenting actually looked like. And it is, like you say, very strength-based and, and it's very tikanga Māori. So maybe I encourage them to start that journey. Yeah. Um, but I suppose Western stuff still has some, you know, um, applicability to us today. It's not all bad, the Western stuff. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. But yeah, I do agree with you, Fakaro. But I think mm, let's be gentle and supportive of each other because mm -hmm. everyone's at a different place with what they know, and you really want to help people rather than criticise them. Yeah, mm. awesome, Nathan. How do we best implement boundaries and consequences to our 16-year-old son who refuses to take accountability? We're met with threats of moving out, and he will isolate himself from us and take off with his friends for days with no contact. Okay, that's difficult, isn't it? Because when I, when I first heard your question, I thought, oh yeah, boundaries, consequences. One I get asked about a lot. People go, oh, these kids don't nowadays, if you can't punish them, there's no consequence. There is supposed to be a consequence. The difference between consequence and punishment is predictability. So have you sat down, negotiated with the child, had them have their say in what they think is important, they've listened to you say it, um, and you've negotiated some sort of contract that says, okay, this is what the agreement is. Um, you know, if we don't do that, the kids tend to, you know, go off and do it behind our backs. So if we, sorry, what I was trying to say was the difference between consequence is the predictability. If we sit down and negotiate, the kid knows what's going to happen if he doesn't come home till midnight. Um, 
Whereas if we don't have that conversation, we don't talk about what the outcome is, and then he comes home at midnight and we issue something like you've lost your cell phone, that's a punishment. Mm. So be very clear that there's no amount of punishment that's good. Punishment is really our own ability, inability to control our own emotion. But to sit down beforehand, negotiate it, um, and then when the, they don't follow the boundary and we put forward the consequence, it could be the same thing, but now it was predictable, so therefore it's a consequence. Children flourish in consequences. Um, they uh, don't do very well in, in a, a punishment environment. But that's just in general. You've got a 16-year-old who's staying away from home for long periods of time, um, you know, is like sort of on the outer. So, I mean, this might be a bit different for people, but I think you want to focus on getting that child back on side. If he's leaving and he could leave, the last thing you want is your 16-year-old out, not talking to you, surf couching, you know, couch surfing with his friends. I might sit down with that child and say, okay, you are 16 now. You are older. You know, I know you don't like your, the rules that your father or mother and I make, but we do these things because that's, you know, we love you and we want you to be safe. You know, we want you to have fun as well. We know these are the best years of your life. Um, I'm sure we can come up with some agreement where you get to have the fun and the newfound sort of adult freedom that you haven't had before, and we can still be a bit reassured as parents that you are safe, that if anything goes wrong, you'll call us. So rather than going into war with your 16-year-old, because that's a war you might lose if he actually can leave home, I might actually backtrack a bit and go to him and say, oh, actually, yeah, we've been talking about it and I think maybe we've been a bit strict. Maybe, you know, you are getting older now, you do make good decisions, you are often mature and do the right thing, so maybe we should give you a bit more um, trust. So what would work for you, son? You know, how could we manage this where mum and dad can keep you safe but you still get some of that sense of freedom that you need? If he's listened to and allowed to negotiate with that, um, it might be looser than what you wanted, not with the same boundaries you wanted, but what's important is that he is talking to you, you are negotiating those boundaries, and he's still at home for you to nurture and protect, even if he's having a lot of say himself. Whereas all of that goes out the window if he runs away and lives somewhere else. So yeah. There's no exact right answer though, Farno. You know, like every situation is so unique and different, so I put everything out there as a koha. You know the difference when a, a koha is laid down and you have to choose whether you pick up the koha or not. It's not like advice that you have to take. Mm. If it fits for you, if it fits for your whānau, you can take that up, but that's the thoughts that come to my mind with a child like that. Maybe renegotiate the boundaries and come up with an adult contract for what you do for a young adult. Kāpai, adult contract, I like that. Mm, yeah, it's a transition isn't it? You know, yeah. from childhood to adulthood. Yeah. And you know, throughout history, we've always had a bit of trouble negotiating that yeah. transition. Cause, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Awesome, now we will answer a few live questions that have come through our webinar. Uh, firstly from Ngāneko, how do I help my son want to attend kura? He's eight years old, started right when COVID hit, and now he's not liking going to kura. How can I help him love it before he goes to kura? Yeah, that is a difficult one. I mean, COVID made things much harder for everybody. Um, they were isolated. Um, if he's not liking it, I mean, is it the right school? He's been there for a while. He's eight years old. Um, maybe it's not the right fit for him. If you have no choice and he has to go to that school for varying reasons, um, try talking to his teacher. Um, try and find out from your child, is there a specific thing that, if you can get to the heart of it, if he's being bullied by someone, you know, if there's an issue, if he's just not extended enough in the curriculum, if he's not in the class with his friends, because just not liking going to school is quite general. If you can have some sort of quarter with him, I'd encourage a mate date. I encourage this with all parents to have 10 minutes a week. You sit down with the kid and basically they're allowed to say what they want. There's no rules, there's no boundaries, there's no consequences, you don't interrupt them, you don't ask questions, you just shut up and listen at a predictable time for 10 minutes each week. That might be enough just to get him to open up and flow. You know, children take much longer to articulate how they feel about things. So giving them 10 minutes where we don't interrupt, we don't correct, you know, can have hugely beneficial outcomes and maybe identify what is the issue and address that. But be open to the fact that, is there another school in the area? Is this not meeting his needs? Mm -hmm. you know, why is he not liking it? You said about what can you do before school? Make sure it's not rushed for a start. So, you know, I was a bit grumpy in the mornings. So I always, for a start, made sure I got up half an hour before the children, because my <laughs> frontal cortex takes longer to wake up than my brain. I didn't want to be that grumpy parent. So I'd get up half an hour earlier. I know it, um, I would act as the <laughs> alarm clock for my kids. Rather than say, get up now at seven, I'd go in at half past six and say, you have to get up in half an hour. And then I'd go in at quarter two and um, quarter to seven, open up the curtains and say, you have to get up in another quarter of an hour. So when I went in to wake them up, it was really the third time, that made it easier to get up. 
I'd make their lunches at night or get them to make their lunches at night and have their uniform ready and all those jobs. The more you can do at night, the less stressful the morning is. The more sort of kyoto the morning, the calmer the morning is, um, tends to be the calmer the brainstem reacts and the kid has a better day generally. So yeah, predictability, ritual, routine, but mainly going at a slow pace. That helps to stop them getting stressed. Mm. Mm. Hard one because um, yeah, there's so many different reasons why you could like not like school. Yeah. And I think we're often quick to go, oh well, let's just um, you know, we don't. No, not too quick to go. Maybe it's not the right school for them. Sometimes our logistical, practical reasons of where we want to live isn't the education that's suited to them. So, talk to your child. It's the best advice I can give. Awesome. Kia ora, moira kōrero, Nathan. Uh, another anon, uh, anonymous question. Mm -hmm. I have the same issue with uh, my year nine, not wanting to attend school. The kura has not been very helpful, and I am constantly trying to follow up with them. I felt like my child has been left in the too hard basket to deal with. Yeah, it's very difficult because school tends to teach to the middle of the bell curve. So that means it goes to the average normal person. And the average normal person in our society is Pākehā, you know, learns through auditory and visual ways. Um, so school doesn't meet everybody's needs. Sometimes mm -hmm. the kids have good reasons for not wanting to go to school. If um, you go to school when you're dyslexic, or you've got learning difficulties. I mean, I had ADHD, so I got lots of messages about how naughty I was and how bad behaved and stuff. Um, but I mean, I still did well at school academically. It must be difficult for people that aren't getting a lot from school. So, yeah, if the school's not being helpful, maybe it's time to sit down and talk to your child about what are their educational outcomes, where do they want their life going, and what pathway do they see to achieving that. Because I just saw school as something to manage and get through, really. I mean, I, I had some great teachers and some really good experiences, but a lot of it was dull and boring. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. That's right. And um, some kids like to go to school with their friends and eat their clay, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And just have a realistic goal. You know, everyone doesn't have to be A+. Plus. It might just be, right, I want... NCEA, I need to do this because I want to do, be a mechanic. You know, set up goals and that might help them to go to school if they see an insight. I've only got to get, you know, year one and year two you yeah. know, English and stuff and then I can go and do this course. <laughs> I wouldn't let them leave school though without a plan. You don't want them at home playing PlayStation. So it's like, well, if school's not for you, I mean, they're only 14, did they say? That's the yeah. question? Yeah, so too okay. early to leave school, but ask them, what do you see your pathway being then? Because school might not suit everybody, but it is generally the avenue we use for being successful and changing our situation. And I kind of told my kids, make it work for you, <laughs> you know, because I want all of you having a degree. Um, because I just think you've got so many more choices that way. And, you know, I think our kids are plenty intelligent enough too. It's just about having a sense of belonging with that school. So, yeah. Um, often there's a, a Māori kaiako. Yep. that will do more to, I don't know if your kids go into a kara kaupapa or a mainstream, but often the, um, the Māori teacher is really good at knowing what's going to help them engage yeah, and what groups right. they'll be in and a sense of whānau and well-being. Building that connection. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, exactly. The more connected they feel in school, yep. the better their outcomes. Yeah, I mean, connection, you could try and look at who are their friends at school that they do like and mm. strengthening those connections, having sleepovers and those sorts of things. Okay. Yeah, it's a hard one. I get asked all the time about it, and you can't just make a kid go to school. Yeah. Having said that, you can kind of just make them go to school. Like, you know, I'm quite a, me a strict parent, so yeah. I don't think I would have given my kids the option of not going to school. If I had to go with them and sit beside them at the desk and stay there and take the day off work, I would do that. You know? <laughs> That's the sort of parent I am because I'm not going to have the option that they stay at home and play PlayStation. They are going to school. But like I said, I would first talk to them, negotiate, you know, find out what is the problem. Is this the right school for them? Is there another school that they'd do better at? You know, what's their, what's their, how hard to cope up? What's mm. your um, utter? What's your pathway? And, and then support and nurture that. Kapai. Mm. Kia ora, Nathan. Uh, this one is from two. From a tikanga Māori perspective, at what age should concepts such as gender fluidity be introduced? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, a child doesn't generally, in human development, understand gender until around the age of three, you know, anyway. So I like how te reo Māori doesn't really have words for his and her. You know, mm. It just has, you know, lends itself to that um, non-binary stuff straight away. I did a documentary with Prime Television about where your gender comes from. And so it is actually, even when you look at the science, it's much more complex than we think. You don't just have men and women. There isn't just two genders. There's really seven different genders thrown out in your chromosome. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, so that means that when our children say that gender is much more fluid than we understand it, the science is really on their side. So I think I would be open right from the start 
you yeah. know. Um, I wouldn't be very definite about things. Um, yeah, you don't want to impose your baggage, basically, so let their concept of gender develop naturally. Um, yeah, the, your own individual views and things come in here. I'm very open, I think. Whatever gender you want to be, you go for your life. It's not doing any harm to anybody. Um, yeah. I don't want my daughters to be restricted into certain roles. I don't want my sons to be emotionally non-intelligent and restricted into roles either. So there's lots to be said from challenging um, gender stereotypes. So I'd say just be open. Did I answer the question properly though? You know, what are they asking specifically? About what age that you would introduce the concept of gender? Yeah. His and hers. Yes, I suppose the standard answer would be three. That's when children typically are doing categorisation and sort of defining, oh, I'm a boy and you're a girl. Hmm. I'm just saying the research tells us that really I'm not 100% boy and you're not 100% girl, Tana. It's, um, you know, where both of us have got one parent of each. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. we're 50% exactly. each. And, um, even, you know, we talk about traits like competitiveness as being a male trait. But really, I went to a country school. I don't have much competitiveness. There was no teams. There was only 40 kids in the whole school. I don't know your background, Tana, but Tana could have spent her whole life being playing tennis, a championship tennis, and is hugely competitive. That could then be that actually she's got more of the male trait of competitiveness than I do. So at the end of the day, we're all a mosaic, they call yeah. it. You know, you're probably, you're probably mainly female with male traits. I'm probably mainly male with female traits, and that's how we all are, so just be open. Awesome. Mm. Thank you for answering that Pātai, and I'm sure a Pātai that a lot of us can uh, relate to. Uh, mm. The next Pātai is when should we worry about a child's anxiety? When is it too much for us to handle at home and need professional help? I think you should worry about anxiety right from the start. You know, that means babies cry and it sets off your HPA axis, your hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal. What that means is that you get really distressed when you hear the baby crying. Mm. There's a reason for that because babies aren't supposed to be really distressed. There's a difference between grizzling and settling down and actually being distressed. So um, being really distressed as a newborn baby is not a good idea. In the first year of life, being distressed is not a good idea. So in that terms, that's anxiety. Worry about it from the start. I think as soon as your kid starts talking about anxiety, as parents we tend to think, you know, oh, you do not have anxiety, you're fine, you know, it's just normal. But when you negate it in that way, it actually makes it a bigger problem. So just be, it's not so much what age you start, but when kids say, I've got anxiety, rather than just going, you validate it and go, oh, you know, I'm sorry you're experiencing that, but also end with giving them something they can do or putting the responsibility back on them to how are you going to manage your anxiety. If we just go, oh, poor you, you've got anxiety, they develop a, a, a consciousness of having anxiety, that's a very passive, powerless place to be in. So I'd say to my child, oh, I'm sorry that you're experiencing that. That can be really overwhelming, you know. Um, so we're going to have to look at some things that you can do, you know, that um, might be able to counteract that or help balance that. You know, we know that controlled breathing, um, yoga, you know, meditating at the start of the day, these are things that engage the other system in your body, which calms the anxiety down. Anxiety is basically your, um, I don't remember it, sympathetic nervous system, and the other one to calm it down is called your parasympathetic nervous system. Mm. Yeah. So I'm probably being a bit worried there, but I'm meaning don't just go, oh, that sucks. Yeah. You know, give them a a strategy or encourage them to come up with a strategy for what are you going to do about it. And I think that language leads to more better outcomes and um, yeah, is more productive and healthy and, and taking charge of the situation. Yeah, right. Mm. Nathan, uh, from Stacey, how can we deal with our friends, uh, our children's friends who are bad influencers? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I mean, my mother saying this, I'm still friends with some of the friends that were bad influencers. Um, I mean, your parents are correct if they're teenagers because your social groups that you hang out with as a teenager, you do tend to hang out with for the rest of your life. So bad influences do have a bad influence, you know. That's in adolescence, though. When they're in primary school, there's things to be learned from the kids with bad behaviours as well, you know, because you see the extremes of behaviour. Um, you can learn a bit of tolerance. Oftentimes those extremely naughty kids are coming from hard backgrounds and they're traumatised. Um, you know, I don't know... I'm just thinking, can you do some social engineering there? You know, the kid that you do like, then you really bend over backwards to facilitate them coming over for the night and to stay. And, you know, you make it easy, you go and pick them up and you, yeah, and maybe make it not quite so easy for the kids that um, mm. you don't have the same fondness for. Yeah. But I would encourage you to have a wide range of social groups, you know. So, I, mean, I just know I was that naughty kid and I'm lovely, really. So <laughs> persevere, you know. <laughs> Sometimes under that um, surface is, you know, a kid that's just wanting love and attention like everybody else. Right. Mm. So the answer is aroha. Yeah, aroha. Yep, and balance, you know. Yeah. Uh, they're right to be concerned if all of the kids are naughty and your kids are hanging out there. Yeah. 
I um, moved one of my foster children's schools because I could see he was going down that path and he was starting to hang out at the mall mm. and with the bad kids at the mall and I know where that's going. So <laughs> I shifted him to a whole different school where there was a very different culture. They didn't yeah. hang out at the mall. I mean, it's an extreme example, but um, yeah. Good boy. And uh, last question, uh, there has been a bully involved. The response from the school was, how about we get her to attend half days? Not really solving the problem, is it? No, um, if she's, yeah, that's not solving the problem. What I really like is restorative practice. Um, we're basically, it's very similar to Māori process. You have to get together and have a hui. You know, people um, in restorative practice, the bully, if you like, gets to understand the consequences of their behaviour because they hear it from the person bullied, they hear it from the parents, they hear the impact. Um, and they have to actually take steps and actions to, um, you know, fuck a ticket, that relationship. A rupture and repair, if there's been a rupture, they have to repair it. So it's a natural, healthy process, um, encourages empathy and encourages conflict resolution. Really, when you find bullying is a, a dynamic, it's a two-way. Generally, the person being bullied was involved in the interaction. Now, not all the time. Sometimes they get attacked at a bus shelter on the way home, you know, and it's got nothing to do with them. It's just about the bully. But nine times out of ten, it's an interaction. So just going, oh, the other kid's really evil and my kid's an angel, that's not helpful, you know. What is your child doing that's maybe encouraging it or um, not avoiding it? And, yeah. We have a tendency to see our own kids as angels and the other kids as bullies, but yeah. really um, every kid's loved by someone. Um, and every kid has the potential to be, you know, really horrible. So don't jump in and judge who's right and wrong, but look at what are the skills they need to get out of that situation. Yeah, conflict resolution. And that's why I like restorative practice. Yep, it focuses on that solution and empowers the child with a bit more emotional intelligence about what to do next time. Ka mm. pai. Uh, that comes to the end of our question and answers. Tēnā koutou yo koutou pātai. Uh, hei whakakapiake i tēnei o ngā, ngā hōtaka. Um, Nathan, do you have any last words for our viewers? Um, just be gentle on yourself. You know, parenting is hard, especially when you move into the adolescent years. Um, so, you know, um, you only have to be a good enough parent, according to the literature. So not great, not good, good enough. So yeah. I think focus on your child's self-esteem, you know. Um, Loving yourself is really important um, and yeah, having a sense of belonging. So focus on that stuff and you can't go wrong. Kia ora koutou. Tēnā koe. Nō reira, I hope you all thoroughly enjoyed Nathan's kōrero. I really enjoyed my time with you, Nathan. Kia ora tana. Uh, and have taken away some valuable insights to share uh, and implement with my whānau. And I hope you all listening in your whare have um, also taken away some insights as well to share with your whānau. Nathan, on behalf of NIB and our members, uh, we thank you for your time, your wisdom and your knowledge. Kei te tere tere pū mahara o te ora, te tangata whakatakiri te waka o te haora, tēnā koe. Kia ora. Tēnā koe i o pukenga, i o mātauranga, hei te monga kai mā tātou. Nei rā te reo o mihi e karapoti atu nei, kia tau te mauri, ko te mauri tēnei kātou. Hui te marama, hui te ora, hui e, taiki e.